This is Creative Banter. After a month-long break, Ben and I are back in action, ready to discuss all things creativity, nature, and whatever else comes to mind. Given it's the primary excuse for our absence, in this episode, we are discussing my trip to Colorado and the power of proximity. We talk about the photographic struggles I was met with, the potential of a return visit, and we continue our conversation on maintaining a greater awareness of nature, a running theme in our weekly talks. Let's dive right into it, shall we? weird i can hear the rain from in here hey really oh wow. wow you've got rain yeah well that's nice yeah we finally got rain after i don't know i mean honest because of being on the colorado trip i don't know how exactly the weather was while i was gone but according to my plants that my sister lovingly forgot to water for me um <laughs> <laughs> it's uh they weren't all that great didn't get all that much water around here so so how how long were you gone for so we left on the 21st of July, I think. I get these dates right here. Yeah, so we, we left on the 20th of July, and we got back into Pennsylvania on the 6th of August. Oh, wow. That's, that's a good long trip. Yeah, it was, it was funny because we got to, I want to say like the middle of the first week, and my dad and I were tra- talking, trying to figure out what we wanted to do for the next day and for the next few days. And I'm like, how are we going to fill two weeks with activities and such but man yeah. there's right where we were there's so much to do i mean we so we went out for those two weeks we drove out from pennsylvania to kansas city kansas because my dad has a buddy of his that he graduated high school with um this buddy is essentially the reason why my parents met and got married that's how they hmm. got together so we stayed overnight with them and then stayed an extra or stayed a full day with them actually and then did the other 12 hours or so talk about a long haul i mean that first day was about 19 hours of driving that's that is a very long drive yeah i i i I know firsthand how that is uh after a while you're just like we are we're still doing this we're still and we have so many hours left to go yeah i've i i know firsthand that that is that is a long drive and that's also uh over a lot of uh flat areas as well very boring without, drive yeah yeah w- without the scenery like at least when my wife and i would drive up to yellowstone in one day from san diego there's quite a variety of scenery along the way from the the deserts the mountains and then all the way into yellowstone but but yeah that's, that's a little bit different uh for the drive that you did yeah i mean the drive out there was just it was flat it was boring wasn't like anything exciting to see nothing at all so and it what made it worse i think is like my dad did most of the driving throughout the trip i think i only drove for maybe three hours at one point mm-hmm. because of being in the truck and having the trailer behind and all of that and just yeah. it was just one of those deals of he was fine with driving so he did and so i was just kind of sitting in the passenger seat like playing on my phone here and there reading a little bit just trying to kill 19 hours and it's makes it really difficult so especially when you're not like i'm not one for sleeping in the car so yeah yeah me neither now now in in a perfect world are you more of a driver or would you rather be a passenger driver all the way yeah same here that's why like any that, trip- and that's that's got to be rough to to be passengering for that long my wife loves to be a passenger she does not enjoy driving and i love driving so when we go on our road trips I do 100% of the driving. She doesn't, she doesn't do any because it gives me something to do, yep. to, to look at, to look forward to. But I would have a hard time passengering for, for that long. Yeah, I'm the same way. Any trip that my girlfriend and I go on, maybe on the way out to wherever we're headed, like we'll split up the driving a little bit. But typically, once we get there, I do all the driving. Once we're coming back home, I'll just do the whole drive through just because, like I said, I don't like sitting in the passenger seat. I don't, I can't sleep in the car. So I, and I like to have that control. Like that's the biggest thing with me is I like to have control as much as I can. So yeah, passengering is not the most fun, but that's all right. So yeah. 
Yeah, so we went out there, finished up the drive, and we had brought along each of our motorcycles, and then we each brought along one of our four-wheelers from up in our mountain house, because there's a lot of trails around Lake City and the San Juan Mountain Range and Alpine Loops out there, um, and all over Colorado, from my understanding, there are ATV trails. So that's pretty much what we did the entire first week that we were out there. Just hitting these different trails, we rented a uh, side-by-side ATV and hit the Alpine Loop for one of the days that took from, I think, 6 o'clock. 6 in the morning is when we left the cabin, and we got back around 4.30, I think. Wow. Yeah. So, very, very long days, almost constantly nonstop. Uh, And then the, uh, the second week was just a lot of motorcycle rides, just doing long loops. What's amazing about Colorado that I hadn't realized, and you go and you plug in directions and you try to figure out, okay, from Lake City to like, let's say Telluride, it's 75 miles away. And you think, all right, Mm -hmm. that's like an hour, hour and a half, whatever, depending. Yeah, no, it's like four hours to get there (laughs) because you have to go all the way around the mountains and... It's such a roundabout way of going through things. So trying to navigate things, we ended up, we decided that on Thursday, because we left a day earlier than we had originally planned, we left on Friday instead of Saturday, that second week. Mm -hmm. So Thursday, we decided, all right, in the morning, we're going to go from short motorcycle ride. And then when we get back, we'll pack up the car, we'll get everything together and we'll just relax because we have... 12 hours to drive on Friday and then 10 hours for each of the next two days. Mm -hmm. Well, we get to this one point and and our neighbor up in our mountain house, they have been going out to Lake City for about 25 years or so. And so they gave us a bunch of recommendations for motorcycle rides to go on, loops and everything to take. And so we decided to take one of the loops that was recommended to us, not realizing that it's about 260 miles or so of a loop. Oh, wow. And we ended up being out on the bikes, I think, for about seven hours. Oh. <laughs> so we were like... So I'd imagine that gets a little little uncomfortable after a while. Your ass gets really sore, definitely. <laughs> it's, it's like being in a horse for that long, except maybe not quite as bony and bouncy. Um, uh, yeah, it, it was just one of those things of like, we did seven hours on the bikes after multiple days of all day motorcycle riding. And... Uh, We just weren't expecting it, and we wanted that day to relax, and it was just one of those days of like, all right, I guess we're going out with a bang. Like, yeah, so. Now, I'm I'm trying to remember, uh, was this, is this your first trip out to that, to that area? It's our first time actually being able to explore Colorado. Um, We had gone out in 2017 as a family on a tour bus guide thing, Um, not to Colorado, to Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, Utah, and South Dakota. Got but that it. was all just tourist trap kind of, here's a waterfall in Yellowstone. All right, here are the bison and let's move on. So Yeah. Yeah. And this with the bikes, I mean, that, that gives you so much of a different perspective where you can really get out there and explore and, and, and really take things in. So that, that had to have been a, a really awesome experience. Oh, it was beautiful. I mean, the the biggest thing, what eventually became a major pain in the ass was to get out of Lake City into the nearest town is a it's a two lane road that you have no choice you can either go north or you can go south on 149 and regardless which way you go to the next town is about an hour mm. so you're just cruising along at like 60 to 70 miles per hour in this beautiful views and everything um, not a stop sign in sight just riding but it's an hour yeah so it's like by the time wow. that you like you haven't, you've done an hour already and you haven't even gotten anywhere. <laughs> it's like, all right, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But no, it was, it was a great trip. It was great to be able to see everything like that. Um, it it so, also... So, how did it work out from a, from a photography perspective? Not nearly as well as I had hoped. Um, so, brace yourself for this one. So, I'll <laughs> start off with the, the Rico. So, obviously, I brought the Rico with and I'm glad that I did because I ended up with about 500 photographs that I had taken. Oh. 
and this is just like touristy kind of photos taking a bunch of shots of the mountains and the light and of my dad and and the the trips and everything that we're taking the bikes that kind of deal um yeah more of like a just a collection of memories from the trip that i plan to put together so i'm still i gotta slowly work through those throughout this month and see what everything how everything comes together but those will be out eventually and then when it comes to film four sheets of film is what i expect on on how many how many subjects uh each unique okay yeah so i don't know i haven't developed them yet i'll probably end up doing that beginning of next week or so it was very difficult for me Uh, that's that's one of the biggest things like so because we were doing a lot of um a lot of riding around whether it be the atvs or the motorcycles i wasn't able to i guess connect thoroughly with nature like i can especially yeah. around here or even like in acadia where i can be hiking and i'm actually touching nature and feeling everything around me and i'm engulfed within it whereas yeah it's not gonna be as conducive for that kind of experience right and the other big thing is i just wasn't able to i don't know really like everything is so big out there like you have all the giant mountains and the picturesque views of mountains and lakes and the the ice on mountain peaks and all of that but trying to find the small scenes that i'm most interested in that i actually want to photograph and where my love for photography and for nature really lies trying to find that kind of stuff even while hiking is very difficult to do um like, yeah, you can go into an Aspen forest like Kevlar Pass and you can take the stereotypical photographs of um, of the pine tree, of the lone pine tree surrounded by uh, Aspen trees, which I did. Mm-hmm. I have one, but that's one of the four that I exposed. But at the same time, it's like, I don't really know if that truly speaks to me. I mean, there's a story there, I guess, but at the same time, yeah. it's a story that's been told for years now. So it was a major struggle out there and it took me about about a full week f- to really come to terms with like photography here just isn't going to happen and on this trip like it's it yeah. can't be a priority and un- as unfortunate as that is it was it tore me apart um so yeah it, yeah it, it was one of those things like I love the trip and I'm glad that I took it and I'm glad that I had that time spending with my dad and everything um, but at the same time, it's kind of like I can't get my, I can't get out of that mindset of photography and being engulfed in nature and being forced into a place like that, into a trip where I just can't do that how I want to, is really difficult. Yeah. So well, it's also one of the things where in the past we've discussed how photographing small scenes is something that takes repeat visits it takes really getting to know yeah, an area definitely and especially for an area that is so dramatically different compared to what you're used to where it's just going to be a shock to the senses really just like with the scale of everything and and so many unfamiliar elements and you know different trees different mountains different lakes different i mean everything different and and i think it's just it takes time to to soak that in, it takes time to um, really get a feeling for what you really connect with. Yeah, and it's just like when my first trip to um, to the Southwest uh, with my wife. I mean, it was not conducive for photography, but it was really just trying to take everything in. But based on that, I, I really learned so much, which which really helped me later down the line. Um, and I suspected that would probably be the case since it does take time to really have that connection with, with the environment. And I know I would be pretty, uh, I'd be pretty lost as well, just trying to take it in. But, you know, it's really awesome that you took all those photos with the Rico because ultimately, I mean, those are going to be some pretty awesome photos to look back yeah. later down the line. Yeah, they definitely just will to, be. To think, because, I mean, to be able to do a trip like that, like even like, at, you know, at some point, whenever whatever you end up doing as far as a career and jog path and uh, you know job path and all that sort of stuff when you just kind of get thrown into that world just the thought of being able to take off to Colorado and ride bikes around and do all that I mean that's that's that is a pretty cool experience so do do you think that you this will just be the first of perhaps many return visits back to Colorado I'm not sure exactly how everything's going to pan out 
Um, I know my dad wants to take the whole family out to Colorado, and that's, that's something that he had been talking about the second that we actually got into Colorado. Like, the first yeah. full day, uh, I remember that after the first full day, he was sitting on the porch, and I was reading a little bit, and he's just busy looking on his phone trying to figure out how much it's going to cost to have the full family come out for a week. Um and like then he was looking at different houses that are for sale out there and he was just one big like fantasy kind of thing. Um, yeah. So in terms of a return visit, it's likely to happen. I don't know exactly how or in what manner it's going to take part, um, whether yeah. it's like a family trip or whether it's uh, Mel and I going out for backpacking, camping, whatever. Um, I would like to see the Rockies. I'd like to camp and backpack in the Rockies, but yeah. but for the most Such a long ways for you to go too. That's that becomes a barrier. Yeah, that's the biggest issue. Is like so if I want to backpack, if I want to camp, the easiest way to go out there is to have my own vehicle to be able to navigate everything on my own terms, not have to worry about a rental, not have to worry about any of that. But then you're talking a 34, 35 hour drive, and it's yeah, <laughs> it's like. All right, so normally with my photo trips, I want like a solid two weeks. All right, so two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then for the drive out there, I mean, I want a week to drive out there, like a full week of just being able to drive out, stop when I'm tired, and actually explore these areas that we pass through, see what there is to see, and enjoy yeah. that trip instead of just rush, rush, rush to get out there and then be burnt out for the first week of that trip because you're so tired from the drive. Yeah. So. Yeah, so I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen in terms of Colorado in the future. Um, right now, I am I think the biggest takeaway from this trip was just how much I enjoy my woods in Pennsylvania and in the northeast section of the, of the country. Um, I'm more apt to explore Vermont and to camp in the Adirondacks and kind of go north of me more than I am anywhere else. Just because that's yeah. my kind of area, that's what I enjoy, and I know that I can really connect strongly with these areas more than I can with anything else. So yeah, it it definitely shows the power of proximity um, when it comes to landscape photography in your own sort of environment. How long of a drive is it for you to some of the areas a little like the, some of the areas north of you that you you like to visit how how long of a drive is it up there uh to get into the adirondacks it's anywhere from four to six maybe seven hours uh depending okay. on where exactly since that's a huge area of the state yeah yeah so that's similar for me to like southern utah i'm i'm like you know seven eight hours um gets me out there so it, it's kind of to me that becomes a little bit of a sweet spot where you can do a drive like that and you know you leave early enough in the morning you get there by midday it doesn't feel like it's that long yeah. of a haul yeah. um but once you start getting longer than you know 12 hours or so then eh, i don't know it, it it becomes a whole nother it, it logistically it's it's more difficult yeah and then like acadia is about 12 hours with stops and everything so I mean, that's, that's northeast of me is ideal in terms of yeah. like proximity, like you were saying. So in terms of going out west and everything, I still would like to go out to Utah and check out that southwest Utah area. Yeah. Um, but that would's definitely more of a stay in a hotel for the week or two weeks and fly out there kind of thing. Yeah. Um, more of just explore the place and really go into it with a mindset of... If I come away with a photograph, great. If I don't, okay. Like it's just a trip to explore and really have to push that mindset going into yeah. it. And and it seems like the further away that one goes, you know, the more expensive it's gonna be typically, which puts more pressure on oneself in terms of, you know, trying to justify the time, trying to justify yeah. the expense. And I think that puts pressure on us, which is one of the reasons why I haven't really strayed too much further than, you know, Southern Utah, as far as the trips that I go on. And, you know, some areas up to, you know, the Redwoods up in Northern California, which is a bit of a longer drive. Um, but yeah, there's, there's something about that of just trying to justify the, the time, the expense versus what you get in return, which, 
you know, ultimately it should be all about getting out in nature, but you know, we, we do have to consider all that other stuff as well. We have to be realistic about, about things. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of place was it that you were staying in while you were in Colorado? It was just a little cabin. So in Lake city, they have these, uh, they're called pleasant view resorts. And it used to be that one couple or one family, or whatever, owned all of these little cabins. They're like a mm-hmm. um, two bedroom, one bath and shower, uh, main living area, and a small kitchen, almost like a kitchenette. Um, yeah, real tiny but cozy in that way. And then this family decided that they wanted to kind of get out of the business a bit, so they sold off all of these houses to individuals. But the family still takes care of all the housekeeping and everything. So, uh, um, my our neighbor from North's Resort owns one of these cabins. And while we weren't able to rent his for this time out there, it, we rented one of those adjacent to him. And yeah, so real comfortable kind of thing. Um, I can post a video of it up on the Discord that I had taken when we first got yeah, there. Yeah, that'd be cool to see. Is, are you fairly immersed in, in nature up there? Yeah, I mean, you're surrounded by by the mountains. You're essentially in a valley, um, as much of a, a valley as you can be when you're 8,500, 8,800 feet elevation. Um, yeah. There's a nice river going in the background or going in the uh, behind the houses with some uh, cottonwood trees. Oh, nice. A real small town, like no no fast food, nothing there. It's all like family owned kind of stuff. Um yeah, so I mean, you're immersed in, for the most part, as much as you could be in a town, I guess. You're immersed in nature. That's cool. That's cool. I'm, I'm glad you had the opportunity to, to go there and to, uh, to experience the, the different sort of environment. Um, yeah, it was nice too because of, nice. of being in Colorado. I reached out to a handful of different photographers, uh, reached out to David Kingham and Jennifer Renwick. Uh, mm-hmm. reached out to Sarah Marino and to Matt Payne. And I think those are the three that I met up with. I don't think I'm missing anybody. I'm going to feel terrible if I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but David and Jennifer, my dad and I met up in Crested Butte for dinner. They were generous enough to pay for dinner for us. And we oh, wow. spoke for an hour or two, um, just about nature photographers network about the uh, nature vision magazine as we're getting ready for the second issue of that and just catch up meet in person for once i was surprised jennifer actually knows more about me photographically than i think most people do um huh just she seems to have her um she has eyes everywhere it seems she knows like everything going on in the community so wow. we were talking about that. It was great to be able to connect with people because that was one of the other things that I struggled with out there. Like, I'm so used to going on these trips with my girlfriend and having that more intimate connection, um, someone to like relax with and rely on and be able to talk through things with um, yeah. in, that, in that kind of way that you really only can with your significant other. And, um, and so not having her with and it just being my dad and I was kind of like... I was struggling in that aspect too, I think. Mm-hmm. And then, but being able to go and meet up with these people and to talk even for an hour or so um, about photography, about just how I'm enjoying Colorado and the struggles that I'm having. Um, mm-hmm. David even mentioned that he's been in Colorado for, I think he said something like 20 years, 10 years, 20 years, um, for quite a while. And ne- ever since he got out of like the grand scenic photography game and into more of like the intimate details he struggles with it too just because colorado is known for big mountains so yeah, it really is so it was nice to be able to talk with them and then i met i met up with sarah marino in ridgeway um we talked for an hour or so again kind of same general thing like catching up meeting each other for the first time um great great person to talk to very helpful very kind individual Mm -hmm. um and then i met up with uh matt payne and we were talking a little bit right before his trip that he's now on along the colorado trail yeah yeah for a month a little over a month month and a half so yeah it was just nice being able to get out somewhere where a bunch of photographers are and meet up with them and talk to people that i've talked with online for years but never really got the chance to 
talk in person or over the phone or anything like that. So. It was interesting because when, when you talk about the fact that um, many people have found it to be difficult, I mean, specific, specifically for, for David, you know, difficult to photograph the more intimate scenes in an area that's dominated by the Grand Vistas. Um, you know, I was just thinking about it and, and most of the, the more, the small scenes you see, I, I, I don't usually picture as much of that being, you know, in, in Colorado. I, I, obviously there's tons of stuff there, but usually I, I think of the Southwest. I think of other areas as well, where just those small scenes dominate. Um, and I, I guess maybe it's just the, something about the, the, the textures, the plants, every, everything is just, you know, it's, it would be completely foreign to me. Certainly I'd go there. I know I'd struggle with that. Um, but that, that's an interesting observation about how the scenes that when they're so grand, perhaps it leads to struggles when trying to find the smaller scenes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your eye is automatically drawn to like these giant mountains while you're out there, like the mountain peaks and the light yeah. on the mountains. And you can't help but be like encapsulated by them and just want to photograph them. That's why the Rico was so helpful for me. Um, but then you try and get more of like the intimate scenes. But if you're up at 12,000 plus elevation, I mean, there's not much up there besides rocks and dirt and yeah. mountain peaks. It's kind of a moonscape. Yeah. yeah, like we saw a ton of animals while we were out there as well. But other than that, other than like the chipmunks and the marmots that are out there on and, and those very tall elevations, I don't really know what else you would photograph. So like how what was the highest elevation you got to on the trip? I think around 13,000. Okay. Something yeah. Like that. yeah. Was that that was your probably your first time being that high of elevation? So, I don't know, what is the elevation for where you're at right now for your house? Uh, I think it's like 700 feet, something like that. Okay. Not, not very high. Okay, cool. So, we're roughly the same elevation-wise. Um, right yeah. now, I'm at like about 550 feet elevation, something like that. So, talk about a major change just in <laughs> everything, lifestyle, everything while we were out there. Yeah. So, like we, we get out there and we're – one of the things for breakfast that I wanted to do was oatmeal. Because I figured oatmeal, blueberries, strawberries, whatever, uh, yeah. great breakfast option, fill me up for most of the day. I'm good. I boiled, I think it was like not even a half a cup of water, maybe like, maybe a little bit, right around a half a cup of water, we'll say. So I go, I put it on the stove, I start boiling it. I look away for maybe like two minutes or so, and it's starting to boil over the pot. And this is, yeah. it, it's not like this was a super small pot or anything. It was just a regular pot that you would use to boil half a cup of water. And it starts mm -hmm. boiling over. I'm like, quick, take it off. I'm like, what is wrong with this place? <laughs> like, <laughs> never in my life have I seen water just boil over by itself, especially that little amount of it. But just yeah. everything because of that elevation changing. And I think that's one of the things that didn't help too is, you know that feeling you get when you, you start to feel anxious about something and you feel like you can't fully breathe, you can't get a full breath Just kind of feel it in your chest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you're not breathing completely. Um, that's how I feel with anxiety regularly. Just like I can't get a full breath of air. And then yeah. you exacerbate that by going with elevation change where you're, you have less oxygen in the air because of being so high up. And you're like, all right, so... I already feel this way and now I really should be feeling yeah. this way because I can't yeah. get as much oxygen. So it that that's something else that took me about a week to to even start getting used to is just um like hiking around or just walking around regularly, just doing regular activities and you start to get higher in elevation as you're going on these uh these four wheelers or if you happen to be out hiking and it it beats you. It beats you up when you're not used to it. I, mean, I think most people yeah. say something like two weeks is what it takes to get used to it, a week and a half. And so you're just kind of starting to get used to it, then it's time time to yeah, go. <laughs> I I was just starting to get used to it and all of a sudden it's like, alrighty, time to head back down to the water. So Yeah. Yeah, that's it's it's definitely something where it, well, especially like when I've gone up to the White Mountains, which are at about eleven thousand feet. Um and the drive to get up there, it doesn't take too long. It, it, so you don't even realize how quickly you're gaining elevation. But you get there and you're just like, you get there and just like, something's wrong. I can't, 
figure out and then then just your your logical brain says hey you're at eleven thousand feet right now not too long ago you were down at like you know a couple thousand feet or whatever it was yeah and then once you have that sort of that logical thing then you're like oh okay 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 that's this 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 explains it but it it is a weird feeling it feels like you're just on the verge of something and then like when i went uh to the eastern sierra uh this past fall uh, the time when that we talked about in the podcast where I, I didn't bring the camera. I just was hiking and scoping things out. Um, and I was doing the the breathing thing where I was only breathing through my nose and I hiked up to, I think it was around like 12,000 feet or something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, that was, <laughs> that was quite the experience. Um, but I've never, I've never been up to, you know, like 13 or so. I think the highest I've actually done any hiking to is around 12 or so, which is is nothing compared to you know i don't know there's a lot of you know fourteen thousand foot peaks out there which i've never been to before yeah i mean we did we only ended up doing i think two hikes while we were out there and the one was along kevlar pass that's one of them i think i exposed just one sheet of film maybe two two sheets of film there yeah that was difficult <laughs> it was yeah. it was one of those things like you start walking in it towards the second half of it started to get more used to it but still you're going uphill for most of it it's more strenuous hiking than what i'm typically used to especially because of elevation and yeah yeah so yeah it's definitely weird i'm not sure well it's it's sounds like you had a a pretty pretty good time getting out there and and seeing things and getting a, a pretty good dose of the place and uh, I look forward to checking out the the video you had mentioned, uh, the post over on the Discord to kind of get a feeling for what the the cabin area was like. Yeah, I'll definitely um, make sure that I do that's, that. That that sounds that sounds cool. And, and also, as you were saying earlier about how you know you have you know a couple of weeks and you get there, you're like how are we going to fill all this time? There's, but somehow there's always a way to fill time, even though it, it might even seem a little intimidating at first, like what, what can we possibly do to like fill all these days? But somehow the, the days just seem to fly by. Especially because so. in the very beginning, we were burning the candle at both ends. I mean, we were going from about nine o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night or so for the first three yeah. or four days. So it was one of those things of like, all right, we did like, it felt almost like we had accomplished everything we wanted to accomplish within those few days. Yeah. Minus the motorcycle rides. And I was like, all right, so we got like eight days left. What are we going to do now? <laughs> but yeah. but then like Thursday came around, we finished that ride, we got back, we packed up and it was like, where the hell did the time go? Like, yeah. so, but one of the other things too is, so on the ride home, I was bored because I didn't know what else to do um, as my dad was driving and we split it up into three days on the way back instead of the two on the way out there. Um, yeah. Just because my, it's a little nicer yeah, there's way. no way yeah. that my dad was going to be able to do 19 hours of driving straight through again. Um, just wasn't safe, wasn't reasonable, just, and there was no reason to do it. Yeah. Again, we went from Colorado to Kansas City, Kansas, stayed over with my dad's friend, and then went from Kansas City, Kansas to a little bed and breakfast called the White Oak Inn in uh, Ohio. Nice little place, mm-hmm. couple owns it. Um, quaint in the middle of nowhere kind of thing, kind of creepy going up there when you don't, when you've never been there before and your dad's like, so yeah. what kind of place are we going to? <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously did the other, I think seven or eight hours drive back to home. And in order to keep from getting too bored, I, I brought with me, I think f- five or six books. And throughout the two weeks, I was like, all right, each night I'll sit down and I'll read some and I'll get through a couple books. And we all know it never happens like that. <laughs> it's No, no, it doesn't. It's like yeah. you have these plans of I'm going to get through some books, I'm going to do some writing when we get back, and then you get back and you're dead tired and you just want to sleep. Yeah. So on the drive back home, though, I was able to finish one book a day, which especially dry, like reading in the car is something that I've never really been fond of. But for some reason, I was able to do it and just flew through books on the way back. Oh, wow. Which is a great feeling. Well, that's good. It was a great way to end it, too. Cause did, it, did that make the, the time go by a lot faster? It definitely helped. Yeah. Yeah. So I read um, The Road by Cormac McCarthy, which was absolutely fantastic and is definitely one of my favorite fiction books that I've read in quite a long time. Um, 
I then read through Feast of Love by Charles Baxter, which not necessarily my usual type of book, not really big for like romance kind of novels. This one is a little bit different though. Um, pretty good, pretty solid mm -hmm. book. And then I read the collection of short stories by George Saunders that he just came out with last year, uh, Liberation Day. And those were pretty good as well. I always love a short story collection, especially when they're independent. It just, I don't know, something about that seems like it just goes by faster than full novels. So yeah. yeah, three more books that I've now completed and I only bought three to replace them recently. So we're good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, um, I, I recently finished a book um, by Edward Abbey, who I've read one of his other books before. Um, this one's uh, complete fiction. Um, and Edward Abbey was very much a environmentalist um, in the Southwest. And this is his like fictional account of a group of people that are going around and basically destroying and sabotaging all the development that's going on in the Southwest. Um, and there, there's parts, it's, it's kind of like a extreme environmentalist fiction. And there's several, there's a lot of parts of it that are uh, very dated and troublesome when it comes to like social issues and such. Um, but it was interesting how he, uh, it shows his love of the place and describing so many of these places and including some of the areas that my wife and I visited recently when we went on a trip out there. Um, there are some scenes in the book that took place, you know, obviously fictional, but took place along some of the roads that my wife and I had driven. So it was kind of interesting to sort of have that tie in from when we were there. Um, but it was really interesting the way that he describes the wilderness in a way that if you've been to those areas, um, it just really rings true to the point of small things like the the uh, the leaves on the cottonwood trees that just like rustle with the slightest breeze and like the canyon not light and the 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 bird sounds and um even uh, was uh mentioning the the desert globe mallow which is one of the flowers that i photographed on my spring trip these sort of orange flowers um but based on his descriptions which really shows his love for the area uh, when I was writing the the voiceover scripts, I was kind of partway through writing the voiceover scripts for my latest videos uh, as I was reading that. And I realized I really should talk more about the geology and just naming the actual plants. And just, I, I think there's something that comes with uh, having a greater awareness of, and we've talked about this in the past, but like a greater awareness of the plants and the geology and such. And so I, I worked a little bit of that into some of the voiceovers, just just so people kind of maybe if they're curious about something, they can look it up because they now know the name of a particular plant or stuff along those lines. But it, it's a uh, it's an interesting book. If, if uh, I, again, if you go into it knowing that it's has some uh, some you know troublesome dated uh, <laughs> language when it comes to social issues um, and demographics and such, but uh, you can tell it's just his mind going in terms of ultimately like <laughs> like wanting to like destroy bridges and destroy dams and like drain Lake uh, Lake Powell so that the canyons are restored and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, but it's uh, it's it's it was interesting. But it was really those this descriptors I, I took most from it. What was the title of that? Uh, book? The Monkey Wrench Gang. Gotcha. It was it came out in the seventies, I think. Um, so it's. Yeah, it's 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 interesting, but I for me it's all about the d descriptions of nature that are kind of woven in there. Yeah, have you read uh, Braiding Sweetgrass? No, no, I haven't heard that one before. I highly recommend that. That was one of the books that I read over those two weeks. Um, took me a little while to get through it, but it's a kind of like an intertwined collection of essays from a indigenous author. She is also a ecologist, environmentalist, and talks all about. Um, indigenous ways of knowing and learning from nature. And really this book, for, for me at least, having read it and even while reading it, it started making me think really about, kind of similarly to what you were saying, about learning mm -hmm. more about the world around you, the natural world around you, and learning the names of plants and 
appreciating them, learning their uses, and learning or seeing more of the intimate ways of the forest than what most people are willing to take notice to. So that's another one that yeah. I definitely. I mean, that add sounds fascinating. List. I I I love hearing stuff on that perspective because so much of that is just lost with our our modern culture where people people don't even think about that. They don't have the appreciation for such things, and as such, then they when things are destroyed, they don't really you know they don't feel the loss. Yeah. So it, I think we 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 we're lacking of that sense of connection with the environment, and it's quite troublesome. What you know, kind of becomes of that. Yeah. One thing that I was thinking about on this trip too that I would like to start doing is I think each time that I go and I make a photograph and I know that it's going to be portfolio worthy, um, I'm going to write up kind of in the way that we were talking about before, a little story behind that photograph, whether it's my feelings about it, um, whether it's just some made up story the, about the the interactions within it. But kind of add more, um, more of the actual names, the plants that you're seeing in the photo, more of like the scientific kind of natural things that people don't really like pay attention to or notice. And then yeah. I'm going to get these uh, two larger box sets, like what you would use for your previous portfolio boxes before you switched. Mm -hmm. um, get two of those, have one for Pennsylvania and have one for travel for wherever else I end up. And each time that I have one of these finished photos and their story, just print them out, throw them into the corresponding box. And I was thinking after I get maybe 50 in the Pennsylvania box, which is going to take me a while because I'll go back through them, make sure everything's still good and be very picky about what goes in there, about yeah. making up a book as well. And just really having like that environmental story twist within it as well. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah. Yeah, lots of things to think about, lots of things to do, but very yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, I'm I mean it's 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 great that uh that your trip went well and uh that you have some other ideas in store for for future projects and uh I think it'll be pretty cool to see where where it all takes you. Yeah. It was a great trip. And uh one thing that I'll leave you with and I'll tease everyone here a little bit not as much as I'd want it to, but just a little bit. And Ben, you're part of this, so you won't know until next week when we record. Um, <laughs> on the way out of Colorado, I met up with one of the photographers. And um, I ended up doing something a little bit unexpected that I wasn't quite thinking that I would do, let alone this early. But nonetheless, um, something happened. And I'll leave a little bit of a teaser if I can on the Discord. Did it, did it involve spandex at all? No, no, no spandex. Oh. Nothing, okay. nothing that inappropriate. That was, that was my guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nothing that, yeah, not going to haunt our viewers' eyes with uh, pictures of me in spandex. <laughs> no, that's not going to yes. happen. <laughs> oh, One is enough. Yeah, yes. exactly. But yeah, it's a good surprise. Um, good, cool. Good change. Well, I look forward I'm to looking that. forward to seeing how it's received and how we go about it. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's def definitely a reason to tune in next week. Yeah. As our viewership just drops off a cliff and everyone's like, no, no, <laughs> yes. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't care what he's doing. Too much change. <laughs> but, all, yes. right. <laughs> all right. All right. Stop recording on my end here. I hope you enjoyed our creative banter. You can learn more about Cody's work by visiting his website, CodySchultz.com and you can find my work at BenHorn.com For further discussion join us at Patreon.com slash Creative Banter It's a place where we can interact with you the listener and although we greatly appreciate those who contribute by joining a tier discussions are open to everyone whether you're a paying member or not Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you around next time